Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Social Flight Live. I'm Jeff Simon. We have a great show for you this evening. Mike Bush, CEO of Savvy Aviation, is here with us. And uh, as we get started here, a couple quick housekeeping notes. First of all, tonight's broadcast will be recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel. Just search for Social Flight on YouTube and uh, you'll find all of the different shows uh, that we have and, and, and many, many more things going on there. And with that, actually, what you'll see released on Social Flight's YouTube channel as well, I will share it right now, is... Um, uh, we have just released part three of our series, Glacier Flying in a Beechcraft Bonanza. Uh, it's a really fantastic, uh, fun series to watch all about uh, some of the weather and other issues and an adventure that we did uh, even during the crisis of getting out there and flying. And so be sure to check that out on YouTube, Glacier Flying in a Beach Bonanza on Social Place YouTube channel. And... Um, uh, the other thing I'd like to do, of course, is point everyone to where they can find all of these shows, which is on socialflight.com and the free Social Flight mobile apps. Uh, many, many more things than just Social Flight Live even. There are just thousands of aviation events, webinars, educational opportunities, and more and more we are actually seeing in-person events out there that you can fly to that are happening with safe social distancing, and so we encourage people to do that. Uh, Social Flight Live was started to support general aviation during the crisis, and it is so, so important in our fragile industry to keep people flying, to keep your proficiency as well as your currency up, and encourage you to support aviation businesses everywhere, from your local FBO to airport restaurants to any investment that you're thinking about doing in your plane or headsets or anything. Um, this is a, a wonderful time to be able to do something that helps both yourself and also helps keep our industry there so that when we come out the other side of this crisis, it's here as strong as it was when it started and, um, and hopefully even better. And so I definitely encourage you to do that. Another quick note, uh, we have started a, a part that we just launched last week where we're making announcements of anyone that has achieved something during this. Uh, and I'd like to just do a shout out here to Claire Bailey, who celebrated her first solo and in December will graduate from the Colorado School of Mines with a degree in biochemical engineering. And so for anyone out there, if you know of someone who gets a new certificate, a solo or anything like that, send us a note here. You can reach us just at info at socialflight.com. Send me a note. Let's do a shout out because we want to do everything we can to encourage people within general aviation. Now, without further ado, I'd like to bring on Mike Bush, CEO of Savvy Aviation. Mike is arguably the best known AMP and IA in general aviation. He writes the monthly Savvy Maintenance column for AOPA Pilot and hosts free monthly maintenance webinars for EAA as well. Mike founded Savvy Aviation in 2008 to provide aircraft maintenance management and consulting services to thousands of aircraft owners, including pre-buy management. Uh, innovative engine monitor analysis. He does 24-7 breakdown assistance. That's essentially AAA for GA and has authored hundreds of articles and four books on aircraft ownership and maintenance. Welcome, Mike Bush. How are you doing tonight, Mike? The check is in the mail, Jeff. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you the Good one evening. thing. Jake and, Jake and Ben. So Jake, my, my eldest, is now studying for his AMP. And so that's the one thing. We, we need a signed copy of those books for, uh, uh, for, for Jake as he goes through here and try to get him his own AMP license. Oh, I bet we could arrange that. <laughs> so, uh, Mike, I'd like to talk this evening about engine oils, and, and we'll branch off from that a little bit. But, you know, this is a subject that we get so many questions about whether it be weights and, and, and all of the different things. But let's start with some of the basics, which is um, why, tell me some of the basics of engine oils and why they're so different than what we're used to in our cars. Um, well, the, the, the two biggest differences, I think, between aviation oils and uh, automotive oils, um, one has to do with the base stock. Nowadays, um, most of our automobile oils <clears throat> are synthetic based oils. And synthetic oils have an awful lot of advantages over uh, uh, 
petroleum, uh, you know, pure, uh, dead dinosaur type uh, mineral oils. Um, because their film strength is higher, their lubricity is higher, uh, they, at least in automotive applications, can go a lot further between oil changes. So there are a lot of compelling reasons for using synthetic oil in, in, in cars. Um, in airplanes, we have a big problem with synthetic oils. And it's because we're running this horrible uh, leaded avgas. Um, you know, cars, we, we have run leaded fuel in cars for a long time now. And um, having lead in the fuel, which is an octane enhancer, the good thing about lead is an octane enhancer. The bad thing about lead is everything else. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's just nasty stuff. It's toxic. It's filthy. It, it just gums up everything. And um, back in the mid 90s, um, Mobile had an aviation version of their Mobile One synthetic oil, which is a very popular automotive oil called Mo Mobile Av1. I don't know if it's pronounced Av1 or AV1. I always said Av1. But at any rate, it, it got pulled off the market in a, in a hail of class action lawsuits because it ruined so many aircraft engines. And the reason it ruined them, um, and this was obviously a big surprise to Mobile, <laughs> um, was that uh, the aircraft engines have um, a lot of blow-by. They, they've got gigantic uh, pistons and cylinders compared to car engines. They operate at low RPMs with large displacements. They're air-cooled engines, which means all the tolerances are real sloppy compared to water-cooled automotive engines. And so there's a lot of blow-by, which is is combustion gases that, that get past the compression rings and get into the crankcase. And uh, in uh, uh, so, so basically, um, airplane engines are, are, are filthy <laughs> compared to car <laughs> engines. Um, but a big piece of that filth has to do with the lead that's in the fuel. And when lead gets into the oil, um, the oil either has to be able to hold those lead salts in suspension or they precipitate out as sludge and the sludge um, messes things up pretty badly. And it turns out that um, petroleum-based oils, mineral oils, are a whole lot better at holding lead salts in suspension than synthetic oils. Um, the reason has to do with the shape of the of the molecules. So the, the all base oils are, are made of these long polymers, but the um, uh, the mineral oil, the the, the petroleum based oil, the, the polymers have a lot of little side branches on them that are good at, at at capturing and holding um, uh, particulate matter, particularly the, these lead salts. And the um, synthetic oils have much smoother um, polymer molecules that don't have all these side branches. That's one of the reasons that they're so slippery and they're so good at lubricating. Um, but, but they do a terrible job of holding filth in suspension. Now in car engines, we don't have a lot of filth. Uh, we're using unleaded fuel. We've got small cylinders that, that are tightly temperature controlled so that there's not a lot of blow by. The tolerances are very close. Um, in airplane engines, we have just a, a very different situation. We've just got a lot of, of garbage that gets into the oil. And if the oil can't hold the garbage in suspension until the next oil change, um, it, it winds up precipitating out as sludge and messing things up. And that's what happened with Mobile Lab One. Um, some people did okay on Mobile Lab One. If they had very tight engines that had very low blow by, um, particularly if they had like small four cylinder Lycoming, like they probably did fine. Uh, when you started getting into the big, uh, the big engines, the big bore engines that, that, that have a, a lot more blow by, uh, they did pretty poorly. And they did poorly enough that that mobile was was forced to, to take the product off the market. Um, now, when you talk about uh, uh, scavenging and suspension, so we, we think of this on multiple levels, right? You've got a screen 
for large things, you know, particles, you got to filter for something for, for smaller ones. But what you're referring to now is, is almost what's chemically in suspension. That's in, right. In the oil. That's right. This is stuff that, that uh, wouldn't get caught in an oil filter. Oil filters are good for filtering stuff out down to about 50 microns or so, but this is stuff that just circulates through the system. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one big difference. You were asking the difference between the aircraft oils and, and, um, and automotive oils, and one of them is the base stock. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, we use largely synthetic oils in, in automotive oils. We use synthetic oils in turbine oils because they, they, they run clean. None, none of the garbage gets into the oil in a turbine engine. Um, we run synthetic oils in airplane engines very successfully if they're running on unleaded MOGAS. Hmm. You know, for example, the, the Rotax, um, the, the Rotax 900 series, 912, 915, those those engines, which are really nice engines, they're a lot more like car engines because they're water-cooled and they are geared, so they, they have small cylinders and high RPMs and stuff. And um, they're really designed to run on, on unleaded uh, auto gas. Right. And and when they are run on unleaded auto gas, uh, they they the they prefer to run on on all synthetic oils. But if you're running them on avgas, and it's the, that engine is permitted to run on avgas, although it doesn't like it, and the the maintenance intervals are much less if you're running on on uh, uh, under low lead than if you're running on unleaded fuel. Then you can't run synthetic oil for for the reason I just talked about. You have to have to run petroleum based oil. That's so that's that, a that, really interesting point because i think that applies and should be applied probably to to all sorts of engines you mentioned of course you know rotax but there's there's obviously uh, for experimental aircraft out there a variety of of engines that can run 100 low lead or can run others i mean even behind us here you know the mustangs you know getting an auto engine it's getting you know an ls uh, uh, the same engine that goes uh, uh, you know an eight cylinder gm and and that basically means in those cases that from what you're saying, same thing. It, it can run on both, but if we're, for any reason, we're gonna be running 100 low lead through it, we should, be, we should not be using synthetic uh, oil in the right. engine. And, and, if you, and if you can avoid running on leaded avgas, it's much better to avoid doing it. Right, um, no question. Uh, and, it, and it's not just experimentals either. I mean, if you have a Cessna 182, it, it, you, you can, uh, with, it, with the, R or the S engine, not the U engine, but if it's if it's a low compression engine, any any of the certificated engines that that were originally certificated for use for uh, with 8087 or even 91 octane avgas are eligible for an autogas STC, and you can run them on autogas, and they love it. Right, and, and that's the EAA Peterson STC that they've got. Yeah, the, the, yeah there's uh, I think there's two STCs um, uh, for that, and it's just a paperwork thing. Right. Um, but it, you know, if you have an engine, a low compression engine that's eligible to run on unleaded mo gas, it's a great idea to do that mm -hmm. uh, because the lead is just nasty stuff. And right. uh, you know, the FAA it seems to be way behind the power curve on this plan to try to get a, a hundred low uh, unleaded hundred low lead substitute. Um, but it'll be very nice when when we have that. And once we are all running on unleaded fuel, whenever that's going to be. Um, we probably all be running synthetic oils because they have all these advantages. It's just the lead that screws them up. So the, the other the other big difference between aircraft oils and and uh, car oils is that a, a fair amount of automotive oils um, use uh, detergents uh, for keeping the engine clean, um, and detergents are um metallic based uh chemicals and it turns out that they can cause problems in aircraft engines that they they can create a metallic ash which can um, build up in the combustion chamber and uh, can actually start glowing and causing pre-ignition problems so 
uh, aviation oils do not use detergents. Um, they, they use what are called dispersants. Um, and that's why most of the operating oils that we use are called ashless dispersant oils or AD oils. Um, the, the difference between a detergent and a dispersant, the, their chemical differences, the, as I said, the, the uh, detergents are metallic based and, and the dispersants are non-metallic. Uh, but they also function a little bit differently. They, they, their purpose both is to keep or to keep the engine clean. The dispersants uh, try to prevent the particulate material from uh, from um, coming out of suspension. Hmm. Uh, they disperse the, the this this particulate matter in the oil. Um, detergents, um, which are kind of like the detergents we use in our laundry, you know. Um, their purpose is to is to is to clean the surfaces after they've become uh, dirty, and the dispersant's purpose is to try to prevent the surfaces from becoming dirty at all. And a, lo a lot of automotive oils have a combination of the two, um, but uh, aviation oils uh, avoid using detergents because of this uh, ash formation pre-ignition. Oh, I didn't yeah, know that. Correct. So there's a certain amount of, of ashless uh, dispersant in, in automotive oils as well. That's interesting. Yeah, I think that, I, again, there's a lot of different concoctions of, of automotive oils, but I think most right, of them of use, a, use a combination of the two. So um, let's talk a bit about uh, the base stock, too. What You know, you hear the term, of course, and you mentioned it before, of, you know, mineral oil. Uh, versus others, uh, what is what is what does that mean to people uh, in terms of uh, mineral oil versus what the other uh, types are that are out there? Well, I mean it, that's a funny terminological thing. The the I mean technically mineral oil is oil that comes from the ground. It comes from you know dead dinosaurs and stuff from the Carboniferous era, whatever that's been down there for a long time. Um, and, and so if if you're using you know Aerochel W100 or something like that 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 is an oil that that uses mineral oil as its base stock and then it has adds an additive package to it um we have this peculiar terminology in aviation uh, which I don't know where it came from but when mechanics refer to mineral oil they're usually referring to an oil that has a minimum of additives right yeah um and there's a tradition that says you use this mineral oil which which doesn't have the anywhere any scuff um ashless disperse and all of the the different additives that, that that normally go into an operating oil that you use this for for break-in mm -hmm. um now I've not seen any evidence that mineral oil is any better for break-in than a, than a normal ashless dispersion oil like Aerochel W100. Hmm. And and I don't I don't use mineral oil for for break-in when I'm breaking in an engine because I see no advantage to it. And the disadvantage is the engine will get dirty if you leave that stuff in it for very long because it doesn't have the ashless dispersants in it. Right. Um, yeah. You so, know. Uh... Last time that I did a, a, a new cylinders, I've noticed that as well. Like it's remarkable how quickly they uh, they start a kind of junk in them when you're when you're yeah. using something that had a non-AD oil. Yeah. So you know if 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 the engine comes from uh, from the shop with with uh, mineral oil in it for break-in, you know use it, but don't leave it in there very long. Um, mm. You know there there are a lot of of manufacture instructions that say drain it at 25 hours i like to drain it at 10 hours or less it's but if you have a choice as to what you want to break in i i have not seen any real advantage in using mineral oil and it and it because it doesn't have the the, the cleanliness additives um uh, i would pref i prefer not to not to use it at all for break in now that's um, that's different, of course, from you know what you mentioned because you're talking essentially about the difference between having uh, you know an, uh, anti scuff and, and anti wear additives that that are uh, or AD excuse me as opposed to those. But with anti scuff and anti wear additives, aren't there uh, concerns uh, uh, and and recommendations out there by manufacturers 
about avoiding those during break-in? Yes. Uh, the, the, the two things that we don't want, I mean, break-in is a funny thing um, because what we're trying to do during break-in is exactly what we're trying to avoid all the rest of the time, which is metal to metal contact. Okay. So um, when you're, when you're breaking in um, cylinders, uh, you, you don't want an oil with very high film strength and you don't want um, a bunch of chemicals that, that, uh, that provide uh, what's called boundary lubrication, which is the uh, lubrication that um, it, there's two kinds of lubrication. There's there's hydrodynamic lubrication, which is what normal oil does. It keeps the parts separated with a with a film of of fluid. Um, and then there's something called boundary lubrication, which is what you depend on when you when you can't keep the parts separated. Um, and boundary lubrication is basically chemicals that interfere with the process of the micro welding of asperities on these parts that actually is what causes friction and wear. So it chemically interferes with the friction and wear process as opposed to physically separating the parts. Um, and so, you know, we've got a bunch of, of uh, anti wear um, additives. Um, anywhere additives and extreme pressure additives that 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 do this and we don't want those during break-in mm. um so for example shell has um 350 weight oils it's got 100 which is their straight mineral oil let's just dead dinosaurs and pretty much nothing else it's got w100 which is the ad oil and it's got W100 plus, which is W100 with an uh, an additive package added to it that has uh, anywhere uh, extreme pressure additives and um, um, anti some anti corrosion additives as well. And you wouldn't want to use W100 plus for break in, right? Because we don't want the anywhere additives. Um, you wouldn't want to use um, for sure, something like Aeroshell 15W50, because that's semi-synthetic, and synthetics are a big no-no for break-in, because they have st um, stronger film strength, and we're trying to penetrate the film and get metal-to-metal -metal contact during break-in. But W100 works great as a, as a break-in oil. Mm -hmm. um, Philips uh, 20W50 multigrade works fine as a break-in oil. It's, it's, you know, it's a, a simple, ADOL without a lot of, of, of additives added to it. Right, it just has um, the weight differences uh, there, especially if you're dealing with winter or something, that may be where you want to go for break-in. Uh-huh. So, and while we're talking about um, additives and stuff, um, it might be worth talking for a second about the difference between um, monograde oils like RHL W100 and multigrade oils. Um, Oil uh, tends to get thinner as it gets hotter. The viscosity goes down. Um, and oil grades are basically measured at uh, 100 Celsius, the boiling point of water. So when we talk about um, SAE 50 oil, that's a viscosity measurement when the oil is at 100 degrees C. Um, and the problem with single weight oil is, well, it's, it's a problem and it's a blessing both. It depends on what you're trying to achieve. Um, but ordinary monograde oil um, that is SAE 50 at 100 C, has the viscosity of black strap molasses at, at, at room temperature at, at 20 C. And it's, uh, it's hardly pourable at zero C. Um, so it's a problem for, for um, uh, engines that operate in cold climates and have to start with a cold oil temperature. 
because the oil gets so thick at those cold temperatures that it's hard to 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 get oil pressure up when you're first starting the engine. Obviously, once the once the oil warms up, it's it's not an issue, but it's 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 the starting thing. Mm. So that's what they created these multigrade oils. And what multigrade oil is is you start with a very thin monograde oil, and then you add a magic concoction called a viscosity index improver, which is a man-made polymer that has a very unusual property. It, it's a polymer whose um, viscosity index changes in the opposite direction of oil. In other words, it gets thicker as it gets hotter instead of thinner. And the way it accomplishes that is it's a, it's a polymer that, that, that when it's cold, it rolls up into a ball, and when it's warm, it sort of unrolls. Um, and so by mixing um, a, a base oil with this, these viscosity index improvers, you can pretty much get the viscosity curve over um, temperature to, to be whatever you want. Hmm. Um, if, if, if you want the oil to be more pourable, you just, you just start with a thinner oil and you put some, some more VII into it. And I think most aircraft oils that are multi-grade oils are something like 10% viscosity index improvers. Mm -hmm. um, now, this is a really good thing if you're, if you're in cold weather. You know, if you're based up in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, you, you, you just, you need an oil like this in, in the winter. It's just, otherwise you, could, you couldn't really get the engine started and get any oil pressure up. Um, but if you don't need it, you know, I'm, I'm based in California where, where it never gets below freezing. If, if you don't need a multi-grade oil, then I kind of prefer not to because the, uh, a multi-grade oil isn't, isn't all lubricant. It's got this viscosity index stuff in there that, 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 does, that doesn't do anything for lubrication. Hmm. And so, in a way, it's kind of like watered down oil, if you will. So use it if you need it, and but but if you don't, if you operate in a temperate climate, then there's not really an advantage. So there's and, nothing about it that's actually helping you uh, on the higher end. It's all about the low end. In other words, uh, there's the, a mul nothing about a multigrade helps you when your engine's running at right. higher. Right. So, I mean, the, the viscosity of of Aerochel W100, which is an SAE 50 monograde, and a 15W50, which is a multigrade, th their viscosities are identical at 100C. Right. But they're drastically different at cooler temperatures. Um, so, I, you know, I prefer to use monograde oil unless there's a good reason to use multigrade oil. Right. Um, the the other thing I like about it, and this is a little bit controversial, um, the, you know, the biggest problem we have in in with aircraft engines is not lubrication. The lubrication requirements of aircraft engines are very modest. They're very slow turning, uh, and and the, the the lubrication demand goes up with the square of RPM. So, yeah, it. Aircraft engines, at least direct drive aircraft engines, uh, um, ruling out the geared ones like the Rotaxes, um, have very modest lubrication requirements. Um, the biggest problem we have with aircraft engines are two things. One, I've already talked about, they're filthy. So we, we need an oil that can keep them clean. And that's hard. You know, one of the advantages of, of uh, of uh, synthetic oil in cars is that you can go a lot longer between oil changes because the synthetic oil doesn't break down over over time. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't help us with aircraft engines because we don't change the oil in aircraft engines because the oil is going bad. Right. We change it because it's full of filth and we need to get the filth out of there and we need to 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 restore the additive package and acid neutralizers and all of this stuff that's that that's in there to try to protect the engine against all this filth, but 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 gets used up in the process. So, um, you know, 
even when we had like mobile AV1 around, you, you couldn't responsibly run that more than 50 hours, even though the oil itself would be capable of surviving much longer because it just gets so dirty. You, you have right. to get rid of it. So we're, we're sort of driven by dirt with these aircraft engines. Um, that makes sense. Now, now, another thing having to do with when you talk about uh, different climates, I mean, we've certainly had some questions come in about preheating and, and things like that, but I've always thought of it, and tell me if I'm correct, that, um, you know, even if you uh, have the ability and religiously preheat your engine, if you live in a very cold climate, you kind of are always running that risk of where are you going or what situation are you going to find yourself in, and do you want to have a uh, a, a straight weight oil in your engine when you're then stuck somewhere and have to make a start when it's cold or, or so I usually recommend the multi-weight in those situations even if you can preheat what's your thoughts on that yeah because of because of transient problems right and and, and, and that's right now you know I I use a uh, single weight oil in my in my Cessna 310 um, uh, I used to be a half owner of a business that was located up in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. And I would typically go up there about four times a year. And when I went up in there and went up there in the winter with my Aeros LW100, um, you know, what I would do is make sure that the airplane was in a heated hangar overnight. Now I'm too much of a cheapskate to put it in a heated hangar for the whole time up in Jackson. I just asked him to pull it in there the night before I'm going to leave <laughs> so that it's nice and warm. And I'm you know, with you. Me the, too. <laughs> overnight in a heated hangar is the best preheat you can do because it doesn't only preheat the engine, you know, it preheats the, the gyros, which have their exactly. own cold problems. It preheats the pilot seat, which is really kind of nice. And, you know, um, so I would I would have them keep the airplane in, in a hangar. And if it was really, really cold out, which it often is in Jackson, um, I, I would, when I was ready to depart, I would get in the airplane while it was still in this heated hangar. You know, I would I would power up, I would tune all my avionics, I would I would uh, get my clearance and everything. And when I was ready to go, I'd give them the high side, they'd open the hangar door, they'd pull me out, I'd have the engine started <laughs> within 15 seconds, and I was, you know, before anything could get cold soap, and and, and I was I was off. <laughs> That's that's a um, whole new that's a whole new level of the red carpet treatment. I like that. That's like you know we're all going to load in the hangar, get right. everything set. We'll tell you when to open the hangar door. <laughs> yeah, the, and some of the line guys would look at me like I was crazy, but you know, but uh, but I had method in my madness. Oh but, no, I think that's great. There's but no, you're worse. you're you're absolutely right that that if if you're flying in in, in cold place and you're dealing with uh, transient stops. Um, you can't always be 100% assured that you're going to be able to preheat. So it probably is prudent in a situation like that in the winter to use a multigrade oil. Yep. Now, now you mentioned uh, AeroShell. Uh, what about uh, when you, and you also did did touch on Philips uh, on their 20W50, which, you know, uh, is something I tend to use very frequently. Uh, they also have a few other uh, you know oils as well and i think there's a there's a liberty or there's some others can you touch on some of the other kind of brands or, or and what are in those different packages uh well you i think you're referring to the, the a, a relatively new oil that phillips released called victory oil the victory i'm sorry and <laughs> liberty um, victory yeah the victory oil is 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 very simply um uh, the, the, the Philips XC 20W50 to which the lycoming LW16702 snake oil um, extreme snake pressure oil. additive is added, which I believe is is butylated triphenyl phosphate. It, it was originally uh, tricresyl phosphate TCP, the Andy Granatelli stuff. Um, but I think TCP has fallen into disfavor because it's so highly toxic. So now they use this stuff called uh, butylated triphenyl phosphate, which is a close chemical relative of, of tricresyl phosphate. And I think that's what's in the like, like homing snake oil. <laughs> and, um, and the victory oil is, is basically uh, the same as their XC oil, but it has this uh, extreme pressure additive 
uh, added to it to to help with the uh, with cam and is that uh, the same lifter wear is that the same tcp that you basically can't get anymore that used to add to fuel for for lead scavenging mm, i thought you could get it um, okay can you still get it and, yeah and that that is alcor sells it or sold it or something i i th i wasn't aware that it became unavailable and it's um uh, it's sold as a fuel additive uh, as a as a, a supplementary lead scavenging additive and it is a tcp and it is it's quite toxic stuff um, yeah i know it's nasty i wasn't sure what the availability was anymore i just had heard of course like the rumblings yeah. of Probably isn't know. available in California because nothing's available. Like I can't even get MEK anymore in California. It's just <laughs> terrible. I have to I have to fly to Las Vegas and and fly my MEK back into the state <laughs> illicitly. We, we can't get it here either. It's all MEK substitute, uh, which I have no yeah. idea what is actually an oh. MEK substitute. And I actually even tried to get uh, a, a plyo bond recently and found that they wouldn't even ship that. Oh to God, where it's, we are. Ter like a, it's terrible. Yeah, the, 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 you can buy a version that uh, that doesn't stick to anything. I guess it's a you know Teflon version. I know, I know the the MEK substitute must not be nearly as good as the genuine stuff because if no. you got your fingers in the genuine stuff, it would all tingle and everything. And if you you can dip <laughs> your fingers in the substitute, you don't feel a thing. So it can't possibly be as good. <laughs> That's a good way of measuring it. Um, now, what about uh, well? There's a couple stages to storage. I mean, one stage is the idea that people are just flying less in the winter. And in that case, the question is, what, what does oil matter? And then there's, of course, real, you know, more long-term storage. Can, can you talk about those and what oils you're thinking about there? Um, sure. The, the, um, a couple of things about that. One is, um, if, if you know the airplane's going to be inactive for a while, um, and that frequently happens during the winter time when the weather is not so good. Um, it's a good idea to change the oil before you put the airplane down. If the if the airplane's going to be sitting there for three months, um, you would much rather have it sit there with clean oil in it, right? Than than to have uh, some some old nasty oil that's that 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 is high in acid and 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 has all sorts of uh, a particulate stuff that would like to settle out. Um, so it's when the engine, you know, if you're trying to decide whether to change the oil before you down the airplane or right after you resurrect it, it's it's a good idea to do it before. Right. Um, if the engine's going to sit for a long time, um, you need to do something to inhibit corrosion. Uh, corrosion is the is the biggest engine killer we have. If 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 your piston engine doesn't make TBO, it almost certainly is not going to be because you wore it out. It's going to be because it corroded. Uh, cam and lifter um, problems are the biggest reason that engines fail to make TBO. Um, so we have to do something about the corrosion problem when the it's, and again this is not a problem we usually have with cars because cars typically don't sit for un, un run for a long period of time, uh, but aircraft do. So um, and of course if you know if if you're if you're based in in Tucson or or, or Denver or Missoula Montana you probably don't have to worry about this too much, um, but if you're based somewhere where it's humid or somewhere where you're near the coast or near the Great Lakes or anything like that, then you have to worry about it a lot. So there's a couple of things you can do. You can you can pickle the engine and there's a procedure, both Continental and Lycoming have um, service bulletins that describe this, but there's a pickling procedure which basically involves kind of a glorified oil change. You, you, you change the oil with a special preservative oil um, you run the engine, make sure that the preservative oil is all well distributed throughout everything. And then you um, replace the top spark plugs with, with some little plastic plugs that have desiccant crystals in them. And you put a bag of desiccant crystals in the exhaust pipe and in the in intake and you duct tape them over. And uh, if you preserve the engine that way, it can go for a long period of time without corrosion because you basically dried it out. Mm -hmm. Um, 
The other thing you can do, which may be more convenient nowadays, is to just hook the engine up to an engine dehydrator. Um, this doesn't work too well if you're tied down outside, but if you're in a hangar and you've got a source of power, um, an engine de dehydrator is is basically a little air pump that that pumps a small volume of air of of uh, dehumidified air into the engine to provide a slight positive pressure in the crankcase of very very dry air which forces the moisture out of the engine and sort of keeps it from getting back in because you're you're, you're always pressurizing the crankcase with just a tiny bit of of, of dehumidified air. There are two different kinds of dehydrators available. There's one uh, that I know uh, aircraft spruce sells um, that uh, has a well, it's got a little air pump that's kind of like a, uh, a an aquarium pump. Yeah, I was gonna say, and then it, and then, <laughs> and then it goes through a chamber full of desiccant crystals that dry out the the air, and then it pumps that pre-dried air into the engine. There's another one that's a little more expensive uh, called a Black Max. Um, you, if you Google Black Max, you'll, you'll, you'll get to, or Black Max engine dehydrator, you'll get to it. And um, it, instead of using desiccant crystals, it, it, it uses, um, it basically refrigerates the air. So it dehumidifies it the way a room dehumidifier would work. Hmm. Um, and the convenience of that is you don't have to, keep changing the desiccant crystals. It, it just dries the air out by cooling it, getting it real cold and causing any moisture to uh, condense out. And, and then it pumps this dry air into the engine. Um, both of them need to be hooked up to uh, AC power to, to power the pump. Um, and you, you, you hook this thing via um, a tube to some convenient place to pump it in the engines and set some engines the easiest places to hook it to the oil filler some places the easiest places to hook it to the to the um uh, to the the crankcase vent mm -hmm. but but one way or another you 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 hook this tube up to your engine and and it it pressurizes the engine with dry air so that that's another alternative that, that may be a little easier than going through the pickling procedure uh, right do you find a difference between the the multi grade and the single way the multi weight and the single weight oil on uh, when you're talking about leaving a protective film and a coating on the engine for uh, again I'm I'm not talking about months but but weeks uh, at a time do you find a difference? Well, I I've always um, felt that that single weight oil that that's kind of thick and gooey at room temperature would would provide a, a more durable protective you know physically protective film um the the other side of the argument is that nowadays we have such good anti-corrosive additives um that you really don't need a thick gooey film that you can just depend on the anti-corrosion additives uh, i Kind of, I, I live eight miles from the Pacific Ocean. I worry a lot about these things. Um, I try to bring, take my engines to very, very <laughs> high times, as you know. And so I, I kind of obsess. Really, about Mike? <laughs> so I, I, I use the belt and suspender approach. I, I use single weight oil and I add cam guard to it. Uh, and um, figured that you know whoever, whoever's right on this argument, I'm, I'm going to be good. So. <laughs> um, so let, let's talk about cam guard for a minute. I mean, I'm a big fan. I, I and and I of course deal with cold temperatures and lots of swings in temperature. So I have always tended to run 20, a Phillips 20W50 with cam guard, mm -hmm. and 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 have you know Ed Colin over there at uh, with cam guard is obviously an expert in this area. Um, tell me about your thoughts on cam guard and and also in comparison to some of the other options. Well, I've, I've been using cam guard in my airplane now for about 15 years, and I, I became very sold on it when, um, you know, I I tend to be very, very skeptical about these miracle in a can additives, and there's just been a lot of, you know, Microlon and... and you're and, you're not uh, a Marvel mystery oil guy? Marvel mystery oil and, and uh, Slick 50 and... Uh, uh, Avbland, all these things, and uh, 
as far as I can tell, you know, none of them really do any good, and uh, a few of them do harm. Most of them don't do harm, but so I was very skeptical when when CamGuard first came out. Um, but I uh, did very regular oil analysis, and I noticed a pattern over the years that um, when I was doing the annual inspection on my airplane. Uh, I'm the world's slowest mechanic. It's a big, complicated piston twin with way, way too many moving parts. And so the, my annuals used to take a long time. And the airplane was, you know, sitting during this whole time. And I would always notice that the the oil analysis on the first oil change after the annual would have a big spike in, in iron. Uh, you know, it's sort of expected because the airplane's been sitting for a long time during the annual, and and so light rust would build up on the cylinder walls, and and you'd see it in the first in the first oil analysis after the annual, and I I, I saw this you know consistently year after year. Um, so I started using CamGuard, and the and those spikes went away completely. Wow! And I was really impressed, and I started comparing notes with some other twin owners um, and they were seeing the same thing. Um, so I became sold on it as mm -hmm. having very, very good anti-corrosive properties. I know they um, were even working with Continental at one point, and and I think that uh, I don't think I don't know that that finished uh, that that study, but I my understanding is it was going quite well. And, and so every, from everything that I've heard or seen research on, uh, it, 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 it really is quite effective. Yeah, I, I, as I said, I've been sold on it. Um, I used it for many years before I started recommending it to, to other people. Um, but now I'm fairly outspoken and the fact that I, I think it's really good stuff. It's, it's proved itself. You know, one thing that uh, that that uh, in some of my discussions with Ed over at uh, uh, CamGuard um, that was kind of interesting is uh, he talked a lot about the impact of temperature on corrosion, and that and 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 he even sent me some charts at one point that when you are if you are in the northern climates uh, if if you do deal with very very cold times that that it does actually slow corrosion remarkably compared to to warm temperatures as well which also helps uh what are your thoughts on that especially for people that that think about doing more more consistent preheating um even if it's even preheating you know with a, with an engine blanket well, I'm not I'm not sure I understand the connection with preheating, but certainly the the fact that corrosion um is uh is more of a problem when it's warm than when it's cold, there's no question about that. And for two reasons. One is, you know, all chemical reactions go faster when they're warm than they're cold. But the other thing is that uh, the corrosion is is caused by the condensation cycle. Uh mm -hmm. the, the and uh, when it's cold out, the air doesn't hold very much moisture, so there's not a lot of condensation. In, um, it, the, the maximum condensation is going to be, you know, in the summer when it's muggy out, and then when it cools down, um, the, the water, you know, comes out, uh, precipitates out in, uh, in the form of condensation, and that's what drives corrosion, not just in engines, but drives right. cor air, airframe corrosion, everything else. Um, I think the, I'm not the question, sure I followed you with the preheating connection. Well, the though. question is, is in, in, instead of transient preheating, you know, some people are asking questions having to do with more longer term preheating. Uh, uh, oh, I like see. Leaving it plugged about. in and having elevated temperatures. And, and I think there's two parts of that. I mean, we always go straight to the part of, well, are you causing condensation to occur if you're not doing it properly? But even if you're doing it, really evenly and like have your entire cowl bundled up and everything in there is all at the same temperature even then are you are you at a disadvantage because of the temperatures well it's interesting uh, tanis wrote a really good study on this years ago that 
at one time was on their website. It no longer is. I'm not sure what happened to it. Um, but it it came up with an analysis that agrees totally with my own anecdotal experience. And basically what they said was, and the question was, you know, Tannis is one of the, the, the leading manufacturers of these electric preheaters. And the question, of course, they always get is, well, should I leave it on all the time or should I just turn it on before I go flying? And so they, they did a fairly um, a comprehensive study of this. And what they determined was that if you use an engine dehydrator, and they actually made one at the time, they've stopped doing that. It's not something that they offer anymore. Um, but at one time they actually sold their own uh, engine dehydrator and it was a desiccant crystal type. They said, if you use an engine dehydrator, then it's okay to leave the preheating on all the time. But if you don't use an engine dehydrator and the engine is sitting in ambient air, then it's a bad thing. Hmm. And the reason it, it, it's a bad thing is that the, the, the preheater causes moist air to, to warm up. Um, when it's warm, it absorbs more moisture. That warm air then, then, then drifts around inside the engine until it finds something cool <laughs> and, and, and then starts condensing moisture on that cool thing. Now, in continental engines, the cool thing is always the starter adapter shaft gear. <laughs> you cannot preheat the starter adapter shaft gear. So in a Continental engine, if you leave the preheater on all the time and you don't use an engine dehydrator, sooner or later that 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 shaft gear is going to become a massive rust. And mm. I've seen that happen any number of times. And the the you know after reading the Tannis paper, when when I have a client that you know has a, a starter adapter problem and they open up the starter adapter and the shaft gear is all rusty, my first question is, well, do you have do you leave a preheater on all the time? And of course the answer is always yes, because that's why they that's why they get all rusty. Now I must confess, I don't know what the coldest thing in a Lycoming engine is, because they don't use the same kind of starter adapter. They 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 start using that big ring gear that's out out, you know, out in the open. Um, but I'm sure there must be something cold in a Lycoming engine that that this stuff condenses on. I just don't happen to know what it is. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's interesting. And that and that's the essence of where some of that and that and that comment came from, because I've followed that thread before and and gotten questions from people. And it's been like, well, OK, but if you if you really are using a, a, a good engine blanket and you're and you have one of these TANA systems that heats, you know, everything, uh, then you're measuring uh, and you can measure the temperature inside that whole engine compartment. It's toasty everywhere in there. And I think that's where the folks at Cadwell were coming in saying, yeah, but you're still at an accelerated point in, in, in where you're gonna get corrosion compared to had you just left that at you know, 32 degrees instead of you know, 72 degrees. Right, well you're... again, I think, I think what Tannis said makes sense that if the engine is thoroughly dried out, then keeping the heat on is not gonna be a problem. And the way you can thoroughly dry it out and keep it thoroughly dried out is 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 with an engine dehydrator. But if you don't if you don't do that, then it's not a good idea to leave it on. Now, how frequently do you recommend uh, those uh, uh, you know oil changes uh, for people aside from what you just mentioned, which is if you're not going to fly, get get it changed and get it clean. Right. For for um, the, our general rule is that for for engines that that have a full flow, you know, spin on oil filter. Uh, we recommend that the oil be changed every 50 hours or four months, whichever comes first. So if you fly a lot, it'll be every 50 hours. If you don't fly a lot, it'll be every four months. Mm -hmm. And again, the reason for the four month thing is uh, we just don't like to see, you know, expensive ferrous metal parts like crankshafts and stuff, you know, sitting in a bath of dirty oil. Right. Uh, for, for a year. <laughs> and, you know, 
and, and so somebody only flies 50 hours a year and they say, well, I only have to change the oil once a year. Then for a, you know a fair part of that year, the the stuffs the, the all those parts are just going to be sitting there inactive, in, right. in, with, with dirty oil on them. And you know I just can't underscore enough the fact that th these engines are filthy, and that's our, one of our biggest problems. Um, they're filthy because they have sloppy tolerances. They're air cooled. They've got enormous cylinders. Lots of stuff gets past the compression rings into the crankcase and it just builds up in there right. until we get rid of it until we drain it out you know that's an interesting perspective because uh, i think a lot of people think about that that time that calendar time limit as being somehow related to the oil but the way that you put it it's really more about looking at it from the engine's perspective about that calendar time is how long your parts are soaking in oil that is yeah. at the it is at the end of its you know of its kind of calendar of its life in terms of the suspension of acids and water and, mm -hmm. and, and other contaminants. Exactly. Interesting. Um, so, do you have any uh, you know preferences between brands or anything like that in general that you tell people or or that you push people in certain directions? Um, our most common oil recommendations are if if you operate in a temperate environment where you can use single weight oil, you use Aeroshell W100 with, with cam guard. Mm -hmm. If you don't want to use the cam guard and you are living in an area that doesn't have high corrosion risk, then then an alternative to that would be W100 plus, which yep. has a, a Shell's additive package. And I don't think it's quite as good as Ed's additive package, but it's it it's um, it's a serviceable. Uh, if you need if you need multi-grade oil, we normally recommend uh, doing what you do, which is uh, to run the Phillips XC Twin W50 with cam guard. Got it. And now, and, is, and again, if 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 you're running unleaded avgas, I mean unleaded fuel, um, then then I uh, I think something like Aeroshell uh, 15W50 would be a good choice. And if they ever brought back mobile Av1 or some other all synthetic, it would be a good choice. Um, they do build. They I think they do have an all synthetic oil for the Rotax. The the, hmm. the yeah. Uh, the Shell has some special oil that they right. tailor made for the Rotex. Um, and again, once once we can stop running on this horrible leaded fuel that, that we're stuck with, um, I think we'll are, we're all going to go back to uh, synthetic oils. But for right now, we're you know we just got this problem, right? With, right. This fuel that we're running. As we as we come to the other, you know, kind of the end end of the hour here, let's talk a, for a moment about um, uh, oil analysis. Uh, obviously, uh, you're a big proponent of of doing that. Any any feedback or kind of general thoughts to give people on how to fit that into their uh, into their maintenance schedule of what they're doing with oil? Well, I you know I am a big believer in oil analysis, but there's a lot of misconceptions about oil analysis. Um, uh, People expect oil analysis to detect things that it won't detect. Uh, it's a very important concept to understand. Um, when we have wear events inside the engine, some of those wear events are, uh, uh, are something that takes place very, very slowly between very, very hard materials and throw off microscopic um, particles of, of wear metals. A uh, good example would be uh, the exhaust valve uh, stem running inside of an exhaust valve guide. The stem is chrome. The guide is a very, very hard high nickel alloy. They're very hard materials because they basically operate, you know, without any liquid lubrication and they depend purely on boundary lubrication. And the, if, if exhaust valve guide wears, it's, it, it wears very slowly and throws off little tiny particles of, of uh, wear metals that, that have a lot of nickel in them. And those will show up in oil analysis. Um, 
but other wear events happen much faster and throw up much larger pieces. Look, for example, when a cam and lifter starts coming apart. Um, and the stuff that, that, that those rapid wear events throw off um, get caught in the oil filter. Mm -hmm. If they get in the oil filter, they're not going to wind up in the sample jar. And you're not going to see them in oil analysis. The only place you're going to see them is when you cut open the oil filter. So in a way, the oil analysis and oil filter um, inspection are sort of complementary to one another. Mm -hmm. um, certain things are gonna be caught by one, other things are being caught by the other. Uh, if you wanna make sure you know everything that's going on inside the engine, you need to do both. But don't expect oil analysis to be a substitute for filter inspection or, or vice versa, they aren't. They're really looking at different things. Um, it, uh, actually, when I, when I get down to it, I, I say we have to think about metal in the engine as, as existing in, 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 th in three different categories. There's big stuff, there's medium-sized stuff, and there's tiny stuff. The big stuff gets caught in a suction screen. Yeah, part numbers, stuff with part numbers. <laughs> right. The medium stuff gets caught in the oil filter, and the tiny stuff just circulates around and will wind up uh, going to the lab if you if you take an oil sample. And if we want to find out, if we want to know what's going on inside the engine, we really need to look at all those, all three of those things. Got it. That, that, that definitely makes a lot of sense. And obviously it makes sense to, to be checking all of that. Uh, if you're going to be able to, to, you know, keep your engine and keep your engine and your aircraft for a long time. Well, Mike, thank you so, so much for joining us again this evening. We will, of course, uh, be thrilled to have you back if you'll join us again for another of show. Um, and, and just kind of keep the dialogue going. And, uh, and, and to all of those people who uh, put in lots of questions, thank you so much. We did our best to fit them in. Um, but, of course, uh, if you uh, go direct to Savvy, um, be sure to check that out. Mike, you want to say your, your website for Savvy Aviation? SavvyAviation.com. That's pretty there much a no-brainer, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, check out Mike's books as well. I can tell you firsthand, uh, uh, they are absolutely fantastic. And uh, as uh, as Jake and Ben are also working their way through them, they're absolutely uh, really, really uh, great books to do. Uh, so be sure to check all of that out. And thank you so much again, of course, for joining us. We will be back again next Tuesday night, as we are every Tuesday night. Uh, we're here next Tuesday, December 15th at 8 p.m. with Kevin Lacey from Airplane Repo. So a little bit of a, a change of show, a little more entertainment focus. Uh, that should be a really fun show to hear about his experience on Airplane Repo and the things he's doing now. On December 22nd, uh, Christmas week, we have the North American Aerospace Defense Command, NORAD will, will be talking to us about their history, the facility, and of course their Santa tracker. And then on December 29th, Rod Machado is back. And following that on January 5th, we've got Mark and Mike Patey. So, so many cool things to come. And of course, you'll be able to see Mike Bush again here on Social Flight Live. Until next time, thank you so much, Mike. I always appreciate it. Such a wealth of knowledge. And thanks to everyone else for joining us. Blue skies, everyone. Thank you.